And do you remember when I had those big, ugly leather couches back here? Well, they're gone now. I mean, look at this. This is just, it's kind of ridiculous. Hey everyone, welcome back aboard the Aquaculture Channel. My name is Ashley Ringlespa, also known as Captain Butch. This boat right here is a 1989 44-foot Defever offshore cruiser that I've owned now for about six years. I've had the opportunity to go through the majority of the vessel and find out what I do and do not like about it, and I've made a lot of changes and enhancements to the boat, which I'm going to go over in this episode. And if you haven't done so already, go back and check out the tour that I made a few years back when I first bought the boat so you can see what the changes have been that I've made over the last six years. I hope this video will be helpful to prospective and existing boat owners by showing you what to expect when acquiring a boat of this size, type, and age, and what you may need to fix and replace, as well as the things you can do to make the vessel more reliable, safe, aesthetically pleasing, comfortable, and overall more enjoyable. And of course we want to know how much it all costs, right? We'll stay to the end and find out what the damage is. This is part two of an overall tour of my vessel, where in part one we talked about the interior and all the changes and adjustments I've made in there, plus the things I do and do not like about the boat. And so today we're going to talk about the exterior. We're going to take a walk around the vessel and talk about the items that I've upgraded over the years, the things that I do and do not like, and the things that I would like change. And then in part three, we're going to talk about the engine room, the mechanical, plumbing, and electrical of this vessel. And so if you're just joining in now, you may want to go back and watch part one, or you can watch it after this. Really, it doesn't matter, but make sure you see it. Looking at the exterior, it's easy to see why the DeFever 44 Offshore Cruiser is one of Arthur DeFever's most popular designs. Not only does she have that salty yet elegant trawler profile, she is extremely well laid out from stem to stern, designed for both comfort and functionality so that a couple can cruise in confidence over great distance. But all of these great attributes do not exempt this vessel from compromise. So join me as I discuss what makes the exterior of this vessel so great, what it lacks, and what I have done to make it better than when I bought it. If you are enjoying these videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you don't miss a beat. Leave a comment, and of course follow me on Instagram so you can stay up to date with what I'm doing on the boat and out on the water. That is aqua underscore cultured. Okay, what's up aquacultured people? So uh, let's get started with just some first impressions from beside the boat here. So as you notice, the aft deck of the boat terminates right there at the transom and just goes straight down to the swim platform. Um, there is another model called the 44 plus five, which has a cockpit that comes off the end, which is a real handy feature to have because uh, it makes line handling much easier. It's safer and easier to get on and off the boat. You've got extra storage and access to your steering system and other important components. Um, I definitely would love to have a cockpit, but that model is typically more expensive than the 44 and it just was not in my budget when I was uh, going to buy my boat. So with my boat, it's got kind of a short swim platform there, which I'm not a huge fan of. It's kind of slippery as well, especially when it gets wet. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't give you a whole lot of space to move around and get up and down the, the ladder there. So uh, that's definitely a con of my boat. And going back to um, line handling and not having a cockpit. So your working deck is this aft deck, which is pretty high up off the water. So when you pull up to a floating dock or you've got a high tide, it can be challenging to handle lines from way up at that level. And so it's really good to have somebody down on the dock to give you a, a hand, where if you have a cockpit, it's much easier to handle those lines on and off the boat. But I do have the nice big windows uh, that are right off of the water. So it provides a real nice view when I'm on the interior side of the boat. So that is a nice feature about uh, having no cockpit. And then the boarding area is aft of the midship. So you can see that there where my uh, sea stairs go up to, which those are Tracy sea stairs. They're not Mark clips. They're very similar. Uh, I picked them up at a secondhand store down in Fort Lauderdale called Sailor Man, which was a great place to go to find some secondhand uh, marine equipment. I'll put a link to them below because uh, if you're ever down in South Florida, it's a good place to go check out. Having the boarding aft of the midship, um, that is one thing you have to consider when you're docking the boat uh, or mooring the vessel because you have to have a finger pier that is long enough to reach to that boarding area. Um, so in my situation here, I have to stern in uh, because if I bow it in, 
I would not be able to reach that boarding area from this finger. So that's not a real big issue for me because uh, nine times out of 10, I'm backing my boat into a slip or I'm on a side tie like a T-head or whatever. So having the boarding area aft of midship is not that big of a deal. But for some that like to bow in, uh, that is an important consideration. And I wanted to point out real quick my fender. Um, so I'm really happy with it. I have a, uh, a large yacht fender. It's an inflatable fender. It's made by um, a company called Briss. B-R-I-S, I don't know how to pronounce it. If you know, let me know. Um, I'll put a link to it down below in the description, but it's a large yacht fender. Uh, well, for the size boat, it's a large yacht fender. And I have it placed here towards the midship area because on my boat, it kind of bulges out towards the midship. And most of the time, that's the only place that I need to position a fender, especially when you're tied off properly at the dock or T-head or whatever and it's large enough that you don't need to have multiple fenders because um, as the, the tide goes up and down, the wind blows you back and forth, you can set that fender just right so that it's always making contact in the right place and you don't have to be moving little fenders around all the time making those adjustments as your boat moves around um, in respect to the dock. So I've been really happy with it and it goes down into a small uh, deflated state so if you're limited uh, on storage space on board when you're out away from the dock, just deflate it and put it in a storage cabinet. It's great, and then it's easy to inflate. So I definitely recommend just getting a big yacht fender and thank me later for that. I rarely touch any of my other fenders. It's usually just this one, and you don't have all these lines strewn all about and uh, messing around with all these little fenders. It's great to have other fenders as auxiliary and roving fenders for somebody that's gonna be rafting up to you or if you're locking or uh, whatever. It is good to have all those extra little fenders, but definitely recommend just getting a big inflatable yacht fender. All right, so welcome to the aft deck. It is definitely the most popular part of the vessel. Usually uh, my guests spend 90% of the time out here because, hey, it's huge, it's comfortable, it's covered, it's really nice. And that is what really sets this model apart from so many out there is it's just such a great living space. It adds to your overall living space of the boat. So, um, and it's even better if you have some shades that you can draw down, which I might do eventually, uh, to protect you from the sun, the wind, uh, rain to a certain extent. You have wonderful views. Obviously it's elevated off of the water, so the views can be just spectacular. See, do you guys remember those gaudy, big leather couches that I had back here? Well, they are gone now. Um, they serve their purpose. They were great while I had them. They were comfortable, ugly as all get out, but whatever. So I have outside deck furniture now that fits the space much better, looks better, and is much more acceptable. I already have to refinish them, but that's okay. I'll get to it. Um, but they're a nice setup. We've got two chairs. Uh, the table I bought separate, and it came with this bench seat as well. The table it came with was just too big, and I got rid of it straight away. Um, but these chairs I got from Amazon for like $450 or something like that. I'll put a link down in the description of uh, the set that I got. Been pretty happy with them. The fabric holds up okay. Uh, you'll probably have to replace the fabric after three years or so. Uh, the wood you definitely want to refinish uh, after a little bit of time because it gets worn out pretty quick. And then I have a nice little teak table as my centerpiece which is a nice little addition, great place to set up a um, you know, tray of hors d'oeuvres or drinks or food, whatever you want, and gather around there, and it's a great little centerpiece. And then I've got my cool little drink fridge here, which is like kind of a little retro model. Uh, it fits the space real nice, looks good. And I got it from Home Depot for like $250. Uh, so I'll put a link to that little guy in the description as well, because I get comments about it all the time. It's great to have it as a drink fridge because it keeps your guests from having to go in and out of the boat all the time to get their stuff. So it keeps them out here and not traipsing through your boat all the time and making a mess. So it's really handy having it out here. And also it adds a little bit of freezer space because obviously my refrigerators in the salon have limited freezer space. And then I've got my wet bar here, which I haven't really done much to this faucet. I'm gonna replace because it sucks. It's pretty much worthless. I have an ice maker that I did have to replace the head unit on, uh, but it makes ice now really well. Been quite happy with that. Uh, it's a U-line Dometic product, whatever. It's been okay. Then I finished, refinished all of the teak trim, the stairs, the door, all of the rails all around the boat. 
and I used a product called CETOL, and that's C-E-T-O-L. I'll put a link to the description below. I know a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, I've been happy with that product. I've been using that for my varnishing needs for the last 12 years. It holds up well, it's easy to work with. You don't have to thin it or anything like that. So definitely been happy with it. I've actually not put a new coat on in like the last eight months and it's still looking good. I do need to put a maintenance coat on there, but it's, it's, on, it's on the list. And then I've got my life sling. So if somebody falls overboard, you toss in that life sling and can hook it up to the dinghy davit to retrieve them out of the water. And it's got this lighted beacon that goes along with it. So if God forbid somebody falls in the water at night, you can see them. And then I've got my nice fortress anchor, which has been uh, very helpful for uh, using it as a stern anchor. It works really great, um, but you know it's it's challenging when you when you launch a stern anchor and you're working with this aft deck that's high up off the water. It can be a challenge to retrieve it when you're ready to go if it's just you and one other person. It's nice to have a third person to help handle the line and and pull that thing out of the water and whatnot. And then up here we've got a bollard on either side of the deck. Uh, so there's one on port and one on starboard. Uh, these are great places to tie off to and they're nice and sturdy and uh, work great for when you uh, just have a, the looped in that goes over the bollard. So when you have to work with the bitter end of a line, it can definitely eat up the real estate on this bollard. So I'll demonstrate here. So we're gonna do a couple of wraps around and then we're going to tie off to these horns kind of like you would with a cleat. And so you can see it takes up the real estate on these um, horns pretty quick. So if you have to have double lines on this bollard, you can run out of space real quick. And then of course you can do a clove hitch as well. And then you have a nice chalk on the aft section and the outboard section there. So you pass your line through that chalk and then tie off to your bollard. And in this situation, I have the looped end over that bollard, which is a nice situation there. And then also, as mentioned, with this aft deck, this is your working deck. This is where you are throwing the line down to somebody on the dock or you have to get down to the dock yourself. And you can see, it's a pretty good distance down there, so it's not so easy when you're by yourself. So it's great to have somebody on the dock side to help you with the lines. And also, you know, you're gotta reach over this rail and this wall and feed those lines down through and tie it off to the post. So that's just one of those inherent challenges with this type of vessel not having a cockpit. And so the other compromise with this model, or at least this boat in particular, is the swim platform is pretty short. You get on and off the back of the boat with your swim platform. The good side, that means you don't pay for that extra uh, footage when you go to a marina and they charge you by the foot. So that reduces your overall cost while you're at a marina, but you don't have as much space to stand on the swim platform. So it's a little bit dangerous when you're getting on and off there. And especially if you're rocking around, it can be a little, little sketchy down there. Also, my exhaust is directly underneath the swim platform. And so when I'm underway, I cannot see through the swim platform to see if I have good water flow out of my exhaust. And the only way to see is if I climb on down there and stick my face down there to see if water is coming out at a good flow rate, which when you're out at sea and you're rocking around, that's not very safe. So I might drill some holes through the swim platform at some point so that I can see the water flow, but um, that will be a, another project for another day. One other flaw with my boat, and I'm sure a lot of older uh, Defever 44s can relate to this as well, is the roof kind of sags a little bit. Uh, so on newer models I've seen they will put a support post down uh, in the middle of the deck to mitigate that issue and the problem with that that deck sagging up there is water will pull up on that upper deck and uh, rainwater is very good at finding spots to get into little cracks and holes and crevices which has happened on this boat and when I bought the boat it apparently had gallons upon gallons of water stored in this roof and I had no idea uh, one day I was out at anchor, it was nice and quiet and just slowly rocking around and I heard water sloshing up here and I said, oh, interesting. So I popped a bunch of little holes. You can see water weeping out right now because it just rained the other day and I have not successfully fixed all of the rainwater leaks up there. So I popped some holes uh, in various places on the deck or on the 
bottom of this uh, ceiling here and water just started streaming out like crazy. So now I've just left those holes open so when water gets in there it can just immediately drain out and it won't build up in there. And I'm slowly working through the different pre uh, penetrations up there and waterproofing them uh, like these through bolts here for my, uh, my dock box up there. I just resealed those. Next I'll be moving over to my dinghy davit penetrations and resealing those because obviously I still have water in the roof. And then I've got this nice Lumatech LED deck light, um, which has been great. I just recently installed it. I replaced a crappy West Marine LED light up here. Um, and this Lumatech is really proving to be a nice product. Uh, the color is great. It's a nice warm white. It's dimmable. You don't have to install a dimmer switch for it. You can use an existing light switch for it. And you just um, turn it on and off in a certain sequence to get it to stop at a certain um, brightness level but I've been really happy with this product. I'll put a link to that down in the description because I definitely recommend that light. Okay, so moving forward from the aft deck, there's a little step down. It does have walk around decks, but it's kind of narrow. If you're a bigger person, it can be a little bit of a squeeze to get through there. Um, so that's just one of those things about the 44. It maximizes that interior space, still gives you the walk around space, but you got a little bit of a compromise with those side decks. They are covered halfway out, which is nice. Stay out of the weather if, if you're handling lines and whatnot. Got a couple more LED lights up there, which I plan to change out to the Lumatech eventually as well. And then you have your diesel fill for your starboard tank over here, water fill, and then the waste pump out for the holding tank, uh, black water, that's where it gets pumped out. And then we have a cleat midship, and there's only one on each side. So you have to tie up your spring lines here for the most part. So you have one aft running and one forward running. And it, this is kind of a flaw of my boat. Um, I'm not sure if other Defever 44s have multiple cleats or not, or they just have this one. So if you have a 44, let me know. Do you just have the center cleat or do you have two? Uh, so you can have an aft, an aft and a forward spring line connection because that's what I would like. And I might add one eventually because when you have just this one, so I have two spring lines on here right now and the real estate on this cleat gets eaten up really fast. So especially if you're dealing with a tropical storm or a hurricane coming and you want to double up lines, imagine you have two lines coming from uh, the aft and two coming from the forward for spring lines and tying those up to this cleat, it gets really difficult. And the more lines you put on, the more it uh, pushes the lines out towards the end, the tips of these horns, which is the vulnerable area. So if um, a lot of force is applied to these horns, they can fold in. Um, so it's better to have your lines tied in closer to the base. So it's great to have your looped ends on these cleats because they take up less real estate but you don't have that option every time. A lot of the time you're gonna to have to use your bitter end um, to tie off to these cleats. So that is definitely a negative of my boat is I would really like to have two cleats here. All right, so now we are going to head out to the foredeck. Um, so I have my little fenders that I hardly ever use because like I said, I use my big one and these usually only get deployed if I've got multiple people rafting up to me or I've got uh, tropical storm or hurricane I got to deal with and I'm just going to put out as many fenders as possible. Alright so we've got uh, two bow cleats, one on the starboard side, one on the port side. So these are um, some nice pause hole integrated cleats uh, and this one is the only one on this boat that they welded in an extra little support bar here. Um, like I mentioned if you put enough force on these cleats they will fold in. Um, so to mitigate that they installed this little um, support bar uh, between those horns. And then we've got my ground tackle system. So I've got my Rockta anchor, my Maxwell 3500 windlass, which is a pretty oversized windlass for this uh, size boat. I have my chain stopper, and then I just got a Mantis swivel uh, recently, which is a really nice product. Um, used it now just a couple of times, but happy with it so far. My Rockna anchor is a 33 kilogram, which is a 73 pound anchor. I've been super happy with it. It digs in great. It digs in so well a lot of the time. I'm happy that I've got this oversized windlass because it will even struggle 
to pull that anchor out of the mud or sand or whatever. So this setup has been great. And really all of the modern anchors are really great. Your Ultra, Mantis, Rockna, they're all good anchors. You size them properly for your boat. And really that's only half of the equation. The other part of it is how you use the anchor. And if you need some uh, anchoring technique tips, go check out my anchor out video, which I will link here. I'll try to link here and I will have a link at the end of the video for you to check that out. And I've got my forward hatch here down into my forward stateroom. And it's got this cover on here, but technically you should not have uh, that on if you're out underway or at, an at anchor uh, because it prohibits you or makes it more difficult to open that hatch in case of an emergency. And then I've got my storage compartments up here. Um, I have my wash down hose, uh, anchor bridle set up. Uh, this is for releasing the anchor windlass. And then I've got my hoses that I use for my potable water. So this is, these are the hoses that I use to fill my water tanks. And then I have my shore power connection up here. Uh, this is a 50 amp connection and my cable for my cable and internet that's connected to the dock. And now this is a con about this vessel, my boat in particular, some other Defever 44s might be different, but I only have one connection on the boat and it's forward. So if you back into your slip, you have to run your shore power cord way out the back and sometimes cross the aft deck of your boat and then it's got to stretch out to the shore power pedestal on the dock. And that can be problematic if the dock that or the slip they assign you to has a weird configuration and the power pedestal is a long ways away and then you're forced to bow in and then you don't have a good uh, boarding access to your boat so you got to climb over the rail or whatever to get on and off the boat so that's definitely a con of my boat i wish i had another connection point on the aft section because i do like to back my boat into most of the slips i rarely bow in so that's something i definitely would like to have on this boat that I don't have. Okay, so now we are gonna go up to the flybridge. So you have to go up this uh, nice little teak ladder. It's nice and easy. And we go up to what's probably the second best spot on this boat. The flybridge on the Defever 44 is massive, very functional. You have great sight lines all the way around. It's another great spot to hang out. Um, so. Combining this space with the aft deck, it increases your living space dramatically. And so it makes this vessel obviously very popular for this exterior space. It's really great. And I recently had my Stid Helm chair redone. So my stid was looking a little weathered, a little tattered and tired. I had white cushions on it before and being in the outside environment in Florida, it's very harsh, it was falling apart. So I needed to get new cushions or reupholster it. And I called stid and I asked them if they could do that. And they said, sure, we can supply you with new cushions, no problem. And I said, how much does that cost? Oh, $3,200. $3,200 for these cushions, I just couldn't justify. So I contacted my canvas guy who did my aft bimini top and he's done cushions on my previous boat and he reupholstered the chair for a fraction of the cost. I ended up spending about $850 to have it reupholstered. It's a nice gray color now and it looks fantastic. He did a great job. I'm really happy with that decision. Okay, so a pro and a con for the flybridge up here. The pro is you have all of this great storage. You have all of these storage compartments, both sides of the boat, aft, forward. You have these seats up here. You have storage up underneath the brow. But the con is all of these seats minus my stid are really uncomfortable. They're not at a good height. They don't have the greatest cushions in the world or backrests. So my guests have to suffer a little bit. Yeah, so this is not very comfortable. And you don't have a great view because you're sunken down. It'd be great if they just built these up a little bit higher, give you a little bit of a better view, maybe built them out further make it more comfortable. So they can be a decent place to lay down and catch a nap in the afternoon or set up another seat to raise you up a little bit, give you some extra cushion and sit back and enjoy the views. That's, that's a pretty nice thing about these bench seats. So I think on the newer vessels, they actually started to make these compartments a little bit bigger and taller. Um, so it's definitely more functional in a storage standpoint and for comfortability. But again, for these forward bench seats, also, they're sunken down, 
most people cannot see over the top of the, the, the wall here or see over your, your windscreen. So it's just not a great spot to be, unless it's super windy and cold out, then you're protected from the wind. And that's nice, but it's just not that great of a spot. They should have raised them up a little bit. So you have to set something like this up here in order to get a little bit of a better vantage point uh, and get that view. Then I've got a dock box up here for extra storage, which is definitely handy. Uh, and then I've got my tender here, which is a new addition to the boat. This is a 10 foot AB with a 15 horsepower four stroke Tahatsu. Um, I had a 10 foot West Marine before this, and it's amazing, even though they're both um, 10 foot dinghies, this one is so much bigger for whatever reason. And it's been a great tender so far. And I have a big stainless steel davit that I use to crane the dinghy on and off the boat, which is great. And it has a nice long remote so that I can be operating the controls to it down at the lower deck. And I can get this dinghy out into the water and back up on the deck by myself. And I have my big roving fender balls here, uh, easy and accessible. Uh, so that if there is somebody coming into the marina and is losing control of their vessel due to inclement weather or skill, whatever, um, and I see that they're about to come crashing into me, I can grab one of these fender balls and just uh, protect my vessel so they don't come crunching into me. And then this is one of my favorite places to hang out in the evening time when the sun's going down. It's way up off the water and the dock. Uh, people can walk down the dock and they have no idea I'm up here So if I just want to be antisocial, but still be outside because that is kind of a downfall of being in a marina so There's a lot of friendly neighbors and they always want to talk to you So sometimes it's nice to be able to be outside and not have to talk to anybody. So this is a great spot It's my little perch. All right, so the helm station is quite nice. Of course. It's such a great vantage point up here It's great to operate the boat from uh, I've got a nice wheel have all of my gauges and controls up here for my engines. I've got my horn, my searchlight. Uh, I've got GPS, radar, VHF, depth sounder, autopilot. I have another control for my stabilizers and I have an anchor windlass control so I can operate out and in for the anchor, which is definitely nice. Um, so definitely a great functional helm. Um, one big gripe though that I have with my vessel is it was not equipped with uh, bilge pump indicator lights. I was actually very surprised that they did not outfit this boat with bilge pump indicator lights up here because this is where you're going to operate this vessel 90% plus of the time and you only get bilge pump indication and control down in the salon. Um, it's on the list of projects for me to add those lights up here. Because when you're underway, you have no idea if you have water coming into your boat and if one of your bilge pumps is kicked on, unless somebody just happens to be down below and sees one of those lights turn on. So it's definitely a con of my boat. And then another con up here is say I am underway, my engines are in forward gear, one of my engines starts to overheat and I need to shut it down, but I'm in a congested area or a tight spot in a marina and I need to keep my good engine in gear so I can keep control of the vessel but in order to shut down one of my engines, I have to open up this case. So in order to do so, I have to put both of my engines in neutral in order to open that up to shut my engine down. So it's kind of ridiculous that if your engines are in gear, you cannot access your start or stop buttons there to turn your engine on or off. Now, the sight lines up here are pretty much unmatched. I mean, it's such a great, uh, viewpoint for operating the boat. The helm sits forward on the vessel so you have a good view out off of the bow so you can look for any obstructions or crab pot buoys that you need to steer around and then as you rotate around towards the back the sight lines out the back even with your gigantic deck back there it's easy to see out the back of the boat there's plenty of space and see rail to rail to make sure you're not going to back into anything even with the dinghy there it's no problem backing down into my slip. So the sight lines up here are just great. And then my bimini tops cover my entire deck up here. So I'm always in the shade. It's definitely comfortable up here. This forward bimini, it's on its last leg. It'll probably make it through this last hurricane season. Uh, and then I'll have to replace it. This aft one I just had replaced last season. Oh, and this is where that rainwater leak was occurring that I talked about in part one where the water was coming into my galley. It was entering in through a cabinet that was right here. It was a little drawer uh, that I got rid of and I just put a piece of starboard there. Um, it's not the best looking thing in the world, but at least I'm not getting rainwater in there anymore. 
but you can attach something to the starboard if you like, like a, uh, a mount for an iPad, which is great to have uh, for navigation. So I might do that eventually, um, but it's a nice little functional area, even though it doesn't look that good. And then all of the teak that was up here um, along the brow and then back here, I didn't feel like dealing with varnishing it all the time, so I just painted it white. So it's more or less maintenance free now. And then for safety equipment up here, I have my EPIRB, my automatic um, EPIRB, which I need to change out the battery on that or replace the EPIRB altogether, which I will do before I do any off offshore passages. I have a handheld uh, fire extinguisher up here just in case, and then I have a ditch bag in case you have to abandon ship. So all of my safety equipment is in there, flares and whatnot, um, so that I can just pull that right off the wall in case we need to jump ship. Oh, when I bought the boat, the entire flybridge was enclosed with um, Isinglass windows and the UV stabilizers were already on their way out when I bought it. So the panels were just degrading by the day. So I ended up just removing them all and now it's just open up here. I may eventually put some Isinglass up forward here uh, to protect me from the rain and cold wind on the rare cold days that we have here in Florida. Uh, so I may do that eventually, but I don't think I'm going to enclose the whole damn bridge again. And there you have it. That is the exterior of my boat. Thanks so much for joining me again in this part two of a three part boat tour series where next time we're going to be in the engine room. We're going to talk about the mechanical, electrical and plumbing, talk about all the things that make this little ship run and I will see you next time. And if you would be so kind, please like, subscribe, hit that bell, leave a comment below, it all helps. Follow me on Instagram, aqua underscore cultured, and I'll see you out there. Remember, if you're not floating, you're sinking, so stay afloat, my friends.